Tom Harbin here on the best of the rest of science and green news. You need to know this. We've known for decades that free trade agreements are bad news for American workers. But now that the full text of the Trans-Pacific Partnership has been released, we know that this massive trade deal is a major threat to our environment as well. Last week, the full text of the TPP, a.k.a. SHAFTA, was finally released to the public. Unfortunately for our environment and our food supply, the final deal is even worse than we previously thought. In the words of Michael Brune, the executive director of the Sierra Club, quote, we now have concrete evidence that the Trans-Pacific Partnership threatens our families, our communities, and our environment. He added, it's no surprise that the deal is rife with polluter giveaways that would undermine decades of environmental progress, threaten our climate, and fail to adequately protect wildlife because big polluters helped write the deal, end of quote. And after reviewing the details, the Sierra Club wasn't the only group that expressed their concern. Winona Houter of EcoWatch.com warned about the devastating effect on our right to know what's in our food. She said, quote, the language included in the TPP is more aggressive than previous trade deals and provides broad new powers for other countries and foreign corporations to challenge U.S. food safety and food labeling measures, end quote. In other words, GMO food producers can challenge our labeling laws if they predict that those laws will interfere even slightly with their prospective profits. This massive trade agreement would be the largest in our global globe's history, and it would harm our nation in ways we have never before seen. Our lawmakers have already given up their right to negotiate or change what's in this disastrous deal, so the only option we have left is to make sure that they reject the entire thing for the sake of our workers, our environment, and our food supply. We better stop Shafta while we still have a chance. Hello, I'm Tom Harbin in Washington, D.C., and here's what's coming up tonight on The Big Picture. Tonight, we spend the entire hour discussing the biggest trade deal in American history, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. What's in it? How will it affect American workers and the economy? How will it affect you? And what, at this point, can we do to stop it, or at least the worst parts of it? All those questions and more in one special one-hour Big Picture panel. You need to know this. Thanks to the government of New Zealand, the final text of the massive Trans-Pacific Partnership is now public. We've seen bits and pieces of the deal before, thanks to groups like WikiLeaks, which leaked a few of its draft chapters. But this is the first time we've seen the whole thing as the corporations who wrote it saw it. And that's a really, really big deal. Because President Obama was able to secure himself fast-track powers for the TPP and its sister deals, it will only need to pass a simple up or down vote to become law. The debate will be limited and no amendments whatsoever will be allowed. So if we want to stop this thing, the media is going to have to get involved. The media is going to have to do with Congress, or what Congress won't do, uh, won't get to do, give the American people the debate they need on the biggest trade deal in this country's history. So joining me now for the hour to help us do just that are Melinda St. Louis, Director of International Campaigns at Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, Ari Ravenhoft, host of The Agenda on Sirius XM Progress, and Kevin Kearns, President of the United States Business and Industry Council and the United States Business and Industry Council Education Foundation. And Melinda, Ari, Kevin, great to have you all back with us. Thank you for joining me tonight. First, um, I'm curious, I'd just like to go down the row and get reactions from each of you uh, to the initial release of the TPP. And, and, oh, and one question, if anybody knows the answer to, I, I understand that from the time it's made public until the vote has to be a minimum of 90 days here in the United States. Does that mean made public by President Obama? Or does the fact that the... Well, it was an intent to sign. And he intent issued his intent to sign on Thursday. Uh -huh. And then it's 90 days before he signs. signs. And then you have another period before the vote. So now he's on a 90-day clock to actually sign the treaty. Okay. okay. Yeah. So and it's a, a 90... After that, it's a 90-day when he submits the treaty Right. inside of the implementing legislation congress has 90 legislative days yeah. not calendar days legislative days to act oh, so wow. but that's congress, after yeah. congress is only going to meet for like 100 days next year right, right. so <laughs> most people <laughs> so mo so the first thing is i, I think um, my co-panelist said something really important here which i think people need to understand there's a secondary bill here that's actually just as important as the tpp which people need to watch for which now congress has to take the tpp and write a bill with all the changes to U.S. law, and that's the bill that, that was referred to, that TPP forces. That's actually a crucial part of this debate, because it will show 
all the change, like literally here's how we have to change US law to make this treaty work. So that's a part of this process. Um, and I think most analysts, and I, I certainly know Mitch McConnell and the Senate Finance Committee do not want to bring TPP up before, uh, until the election has happened. They don't want this to come up until the lame duck session. But one correction. A year from now. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's not Congress that writes the bill. Right, it's, no, the, it's the White House. The, the administration yes, submits a bill, bill to Congress right. that Congress can't change. Melinda, your, your thoughts in general on the TPP right now? Well, on Thursday, early in the morning, we saw the text for the first time, and it is unfortunately worse than we thought. There was, a, you know, we were concerned. We had seen the leaks. We had been talking to negotiators. We were very worried about what what corporate wish list was actually in this deal, and unfortunately it is what you would expect by a deal that was negotiated in secret for more than six years behind closed doors with heavy corporate influence, 600 corporate advisors. And so we have been trying to go through all of the text, more than 6,000 pages. We had an intern try to count the pages of all the side agreements and everything as well. So there's going to be a lot coming out in the coming months. This but is longer it's, than the Bible. It is, it's, it's very long. There's a lot of detail in there. And unfortunately, uh, we can go through many of the examples, but yeah, we we're will. very concerned about what the impacts are going to be on jobs, wages, food safety, medicine prices, you name it. It affects um, all aspects of our lives, and, and it's really important that we dig in and understand and make sure that the U.S. Yeah. public stops this. My initial response to this was, this is not free trade. This is insanely mm -hmm. heavily managed trade, 6,000 pages. There's nothing, f quote, free about oh, that. Yeah. I mean, are your thoughts in general on this? I mean, my thoughts in general are, and I think people need to realize this, it's not a trade treaty so much as it is the largest change in domestic law you will see in the second term of the Obama administration. That's, that's what these 6,000 pages represent. They represent because, you know, there's no legislation going through Congress, this will be the biggest domestic bill done in this Congress. Assuming it gets done. Assuming it gets done. This is the biggest domestic bill they will vote on. Right. Kevin, your thoughts on that? Well, it's a bad deal done in a bad way. Uh, if, you, if you step back and say, the United States has done a number of these trade deals since NAFTA, or, you know, since the Canadian-American Free Trade Agreement in the late 80s, and we have this massive trade deficit, and every time the American people have been told, this one's the silver bullet, this one's going to get you, you know, better jobs, increased wages, et cetera, and none of them have worked out, and in fact, we've deindustrialized. We've shipped all these jobs overseas. Wages are stagnant for almost 40 years since the end of the Tokyo round. And so there's nothing different about this. We followed the same lousy script and done the same damn thing. And, you know, we're going to wind up in the same place, which right. is behind the eight ball. But we'll get different results this time. Yeah. Don't, don't you worry. <laughs> It'll be different. Right. Einstein said something about that once, <laughs> exactly. as I recall. Um, uh, Kevin, from, from a... Uh, a traditionally conservative and pro-business point of view, your your position in general, um, isn't you know I I remember the the the, the battles back in the 50s and 60s the 60s anyway about the United Nations and, and conservatives saying we hate the United Nations because it's a surrender of sovereignty by the United States and in a way it is we're giving up our right to unilaterally unilaterally declare war without you know either provocation or or a vote of the of the uh, UN. Uh, General Assembly. Um, but this is, it seems to me, and I'm astonished that there's like no coverage of this in the media, and I'm not hearing about this from any of the normal conservative voices, including some of the Republican presidential candidates. Isn't this a, a much bigger surrender of sovereignty than joining the United Nations? Well, it, it's, I don't know how big it is, but it's pretty big. You know? yeah. I don't know if it's bigger or lesser than the United Nations. But there's a new commission, the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership Commission, that's going to exist in perpetuity, that's going to be unelected uh, international bureaucrats who are going to be able to change this treaty on an ongoing basis as we go forward. So why doesn't Congress just pass an amendment and drop Article One, Section 8 of the Constitution and outsource their uh, co constitutional responsibility for trade to this Seems new like commission. they already did that, didn't they? Well, I mean, this, this almost. And, and we're going to have the same thing with the European agreement, you know, right. the Yeah, we'll the get TTIP. to that a little later in the program. So, but, uh, I mean, it's a terrible precedent. It's a massive surrender of sovereignty. You're right. And 
anyone who votes for this is not a conservative. Yeah. Well, and, um, you mentioned sovereignty, and and under the tribunals that would be set up this under is the, the TPP. Investor State Dispute yeah. Settlement I ISDS. Exactly. Please. Under Investor State Dispute Settlement, which they are set up to private tribunals, and you mentioned the UN. Actually, the the UN rules or the World Bank rules would be the rules by which foreign corporations could sue our government outside of our courts mm -hmm. system in these tri private tribunals, and they would that would be binding. U.S. taxpayers would be on the hook for millions or billions of dollars to foreign corporations, while our domestic companies wouldn't have access to the same tribunal. They go through our domestic courts like everyone else. And so, again, in terms of um, giving sovereignty over, uh, it, it's quite astonishing, and it definitely is something that, that crosses party lines in terms of concern. And am I correct in, in believing that once one of these commissions, which are made up of corporate lawyers, I, I guess, yeah, yeah. Uh, once they have ruled for or against us, there is no appeal? There's no appeal. Um, and in fact, the U.S. Trade Representative recently said that he didn't even support the idea of appeal. The, um, the um, really? a European Commission, in their proposal, has... has put forward the possibility of an appeals process and and that's not even um, on the table here in the TPP. Yeah. Um, and so there's no appeal, there's no precedent. These aren't judges. They don't, they're not bound by com the kinds of conflict of interest rules that we expect for judges. They often rotate between representing corporations one day and serving on these arbitration panels the next day. Um, and, and, and they're paid by the hour at corporate rates. So there's this huge incentive to have these cases go on forever. Uh, and, and or for long periods of time while they're um, earning corporate uh, rates at, at the time. And so that's why we've seen an expansion of these types of cases under past deals um, that have attacked bans on toxic substances, environmental policies, wage policies, etc., cetera, and um, public health policies. And taxpayers have been on the hook to have to pay millions or billions of dollars. Amazing. All right, my, my, I. I should probably have pulled it up my little pocket constitution, but my recollection is that the sixth or seventh amendment, whichever one is, you know, a trial of jury, yep. uh, a jury trial. Mm -hmm. I think it's the sixth. Um, speedy trial, jury trial, and no severe punishment. Maybe so, whatever. Mm -hmm. That it starts out by saying something like, in any issue uh, where more than ten dollars is it disputed, there's some amount right. in there. So they're clearly talking about both criminal courts and civil courts. Yes. How are these ISDS provisions, in the minute we have left in this segment, how are these ISDS provisions not a violation of the 6th, 7th, and 8th Amendments of the Constitution? One would assume they're at least a violation of the spirit of those amendments, though courts have ruled they are not a violation of the text of those amendments. And, you know, that's, that's actually part of the problem. These proceedings have been upheld for the most part. I mean, look, what even scares me the most, not e just these provisions, but the provisions designed to protect us, the provisions that are supposedly good, the things the administration points to and says that's good, what I look to are things like the Peru Free Trade Agreement, where we then don't enforce those provisions, right. where they break their labor standards, and we say, you know, well, uh, okay. Colombia, they're still murdering right. uh, union people who want to unionize, and it's right in the treaty. No, no, there are less people being murdered now than there were Oh, That's geez. literally the talking point from the U.S. Seriously. Yeah, Honestly, no, that God. was the talking point. Amazing. Then. More of tonight's conversation about the disastrous TPP deal right after this break. RT America viewers are smarter. They're critical thinkers. They're looking for more. They want a perspective that they don't usually see. They're people that are looking for the big picture. People who are done with the exploitation of all of our resources. They are young, they're independent-minded, they are free spirits, they are people who want the truth as opposed to what is spoon-fed by corporate media. They question the status quo, and I think they're a little more tech-savvy than the average news consumer. We don't have to answer to anyone except the people that we're going to report on. Because of that, we're news for the people. They're viewers who are looking for stories that are different. Stories about people who need a voice, and RT gives them that voice. Someone who questions and asks more. I'm Wolf 
Let's go, 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 let's
trade is money moving moving between banks all over the world. Trade is financial services. Trade is Hollywood. Trade are all these industries. But the point is, we are those industries don't employ a lot of those industries don't employ the middle class in Iowa. Those industries don't open up factories in Michigan. Those industries don't. You can't have a country that doesn't build anything. And this, this trade treaty continues us down a path that we've been on, frankly, since the 1970s, where we are, as a country, do not create anything. And that is, and by saying, basically, okay, we'll trade you, you take that, we'll take, we'll take this stuff, and that's the stuff that happens to represent, frankly, across those industries, what, what do they represent? They represent industries that, uh, for the most part, are the 1%. Yeah. Kevin, uh my, I'm sure these numbers are probably much more at the top of your head than mine, but my recollection is that prior to NAFTA, uh, really prior to the 80s, prior to the Reagan administration, manufacturing was about a quarter of our industry, of our entire GDP, non-governmental GDP, and that right now it's around 11 or 12 percent, and that um, I've, I've read in several places, but I'm not sure that there's an authoritative source for this, that no country that has whose manufacturing has gone below 15 percent for an extended period of time has been able to basically hold itself together over the long haul. Um, your thoughts on all that, and, and do I well, have any of that right or wrong? Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right, and and Ari is right too. Um, so we're all right here. I mean, yeah. <laughs> except those of us now who are we left. Win. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, the the point is exactly correct that manufacturing and finance have switched roles in the American economy. That's why this deal is not about manufacturing and trade as normally thought. Right, and okay. finance has gone from about 6% of our economy to around 14% of my record. Or even higher, I think. Yeah. But, but, you know, and, and manufacturing, which is a, a wealth generating activity, uh, ha has really been clobbered by these international trade deals and by our inability um, to deal with currency manipulation, to deal with foreign value added taxes, so many other things. So a basic economic textbook will tell you there are three ways to create wealth, manufacturing, resource extraction, and agriculture. You know, you, you take a bunch of trees, you clear the lot, you a lot of work, you plant stuff, you get a crop, you can sell it. Right. Manufacturing, you take some iron ore and you do this and that and all of a sudden there's a car. Uh, there's some gump in the ground and that fuels the car, you know, eventually mm -hmm. if it's refined. And we're abandoning these industries. Yeah, we're, we, we're, we, we're abandoning uh, the wealth I'm, creation. I'm sorry, Kevin, I, I think you mispronounced synthetic derivative. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't, what about the, his, what about pulling those out of the ground? <laughs> yeah, synthetic well, derivative, oh, the, your point <laughs> being the banking doesn't make anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and all it does is it makes some people rich, but it doesn't make the nation rich. Right. They get their percentage when the money goes, you know, from hand to well, hand. Well, that was, I mean, that, that was the essence of the wealth of nations. In my recollection, it's been a lot of years since I read it, but my recollection was that the example that Adam Smith used was a tree limb laying on the ground has no intrinsic value and doesn't add to the wealth of the nation. But if you apply human labor to it, you carve it into an axe handle, you now have created 5 or $10 worth of value, which is now part of the national wealth and can last for several generations before that axe handle is you know, used up or, or, or rots out. Or and whatever. the person who transforms it has a certain skill right. and, and is worth more in terms of wages than the person who can't transform it. Right. So we're losing not just manufacturing, but critically the know-how. Uh, you know, how to do things. How do you set up a production line to do this or that? Uh, well, you know, what skills do you need to employ there? What type of machinery? And it's all going. And those aren't easily buildable industries. Like, we don't produce right now our own drugs. Like, this is, we have a pharmaceutical industry, but our antibiotic supply is mainly supplied out of Asia. Like, just yeah. think about that. And that's a, that's China a, and India. that's a, like, a market need production. Like, they produce, we use. There's no, like, stockpile. So if there's a massive, if there's a massive outbreak, we have to rely on China to produce us enough uh, antibiotics to cure us. Right. Which, you know, which is scary. We don't even manufacture the things that this treaty, that the industries we favor, that manufacturing is done elsewhere. We can't make a cruise missile without Chinese parts right now. Right. I mean, it, that, that just makes my brain go, eh! You and know? don't forget all the televisions in the studio. Yeah. There's yeah. not a single place you can make the glass for those televisions in the United yeah. States. It's all in South Korea, Taiwan, yep. China, Japan. Um, Melinda, 
the one of the arguments for TPP is that uh, that has been implicitly made, if not explicitly, by the Obama administration, is that we are uh, we're, we're we're burning into this thing our norms, American right. norms, American standards for labor, for trademarks, for patents, for everything, and and where we can't burn those into the agreement. We create side deals, like we created one with Vietnam that says, you know, okay, Vietnam is a communist country where everybody's a member of the union, it's called the, the Communist Party, but over a five-year period, Vietnam is going to, they say in the side agreement, they're going to allow private, independent labor unions. Whether those people get routinely shot against the wall, who knows, you know, but um, is this actually the most progressive trade deal ever because it enshrines American norms? Well, I think it's it's quite misleading for them to say that this is the first time that's in, it's enforceable and this is the first time we're having binding labor standards. This is the same language, the same model that we've seen for at least a decade in our past agreements with Colombia, with Peru. We've seen they have had enforceable labor standards. We have not seen those standards be enforced during that period. In fact, the Government Accountability Office did a study that showed that actually the U.S. Trade Representative has done a terrible job in trying to actually enforce the standards that exist in our past agreement. So again, we have to trust that this time the same rules will, will result in a different outcome. But I also think that it's, it's, it's critical that we look at not just what laws they say they need to change. You know, they say you need to change this law, but we know, and actually Human Rights Watch came out right after the text came out and said, the problem in these countries often isn't the laws, it's the political will to enforce them. Sure. It is the, and, and they don't have, they discarded all of the proposals that the labor unions and human rights groups put forward that said, these are the kinds of benchmarks. We need to have the type prosecutions of human traffickers. We need to see these, th those things were were not included in these side agreements. So you see, perhaps it's not that difficult to change a law if then it, you're not going to be enforced later. Five years down the road, once there are all these economic entrenched interests in place, do we really believe that a different administration is going to come out strong against Vietnam if they haven't uh, implemented this? I mean, I think the, those, those pieces are put into place to make the agreement potentially more palatable to some people on Capitol Hill that are going to feel pressure. But when it, you know, when it really comes down to it, that's not what this agreement is about. It's about um, expanding the role of capital, the corporate wish list that is, that is in, embedded in this agreement, um, and that will affect our daily lives. It's, it's basically creating an international corporate infrastructure to manage pretty much all business on the planet. Is that a, uh, in the all minute we have left, is that an, are we looking at the c corporate coup d'etat? Well, it is a system of global governance. It absolutely is. You know, um, but this that is exactly written, what the John Birch yeah, Society but, guys were warning me about in 1964. <laughs> that, but, but, but one that it was written behind closed doors with heavy corporate influence, and then we have to buy, say yes or no to it. And yeah. conservatives hate regulation, right? They hate this type of governance. They want to dismantle the government we have here in Washington. Why are none of them speaking un under, out? Under the rubric of free trade, if you call it free trade, you can set up this massive, right. global, you know, far-reaching, in perpetuity, system. regulatory regime. Yeah, that's which amazing. Is, which is, by the way, the Soviet constitution of trade deals, right? Yeah. The Soviet constitution was perfect. This is perfect. The Soviet constitution was incredibly okay. progressive. More of tonight's conversation about the disastrous TPP right after the break. I'm Jesse Ventura, and I bring you the truth, loud and clear. I was a Navy frogman, a professional wrestler, and the governor of Minnesota. Now I'm taking you off the grid. Join me every Friday for Off the Grid on our team. Question more and stay vigilant. I'm Tom Hartman, and you're watching RT America. The United States is now officially an oligarchy. What happens if this guy becomes president? He has completely succeeded in falling down Alice's rabbit hole and flipping there reality is no upside down. Question more. I want you to look at what is going on in downtown America. Many couldn't help but think that it was a military force, not a police force. Tanks, combat gear, assault rifles. 
today's breed of American law enforcement is dressed in riot gear. Is the U.S. now in a war against its own people? We're being militarized. Police forces are arming their law enforcement agents with weapons of war. What politicians do is something we don't do. They put themselves on the line, and they get accepted or rejected. So when you want to be president, why would you want to be? Why would someone want to be president? What's it like to be president? What's it like when the phone rings at three in the morning? Can't be a good call. I'm interested always in the whys and the hows. And Q Larry. Question more. Hi, my name is Manuel Rapalo. Our team, it's just smarter. Welcome back. If the TPP goes into effect, it will mean more Trans-Pacific shipping as a result of increased trade. And increased shipping will mean, more, will mean more carbon being burned into our atmosphere. But despite that, the phrase climate change does not appear even one single time in the TPP text's chapter on the environment or anywhere else. That's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how weak the environment chapter is. According to Matthew Rimmer, a professor of intellectual property and innovation law at the Queensland University of Technology, the agreement has poor coverage of environmental issues and weak enforcement mechanisms. There's only limited coverage of biodiversity, conservation, marine capture fisheries, and trade in environmental services. And beyond that, the ISDS, the Investor Services uh, Dispute Settlement, yeah, whatever it is, chapter would make it so that corporations could challenge any member state's environmental regulations if the corporation calculates that the regulation will impact the corporation's expected profits. The White House has been pushing the idea that this deal would bring every member country's environmental protections up to the level of U.S. regulations. But based on this chapter, do we have any reason to believe that this deal will do anything but put our environmental regulations at the mercy of multinational corporations? Let's continue with tonight's panel discussion on the details of this disastrous trade agreement. Still with me, Melinda St. Louis, Ari Rabenhoff, and Kevin Kearns. And Melinda, what uh, the chapter on the environment, what popped out of that for you? Well, and for the, and for the uh, folks well as, as the Obama administration administration was claiming that this was going to be very progressive we were going to be very pleased with what was in the environment chapter so far very uh, almost all of the environmental organizations uh, Sierra Club defenders of wildlife National Resource Defense Council some that have even supported these agreements in the past have said that this is extremely weak what we they there are some new provisions that uh, that talk about different conservation goals, but the language in them is vague and it is quite, and it's non-binding, even though the, the uh, chapter itself is enforceable, but it, uh, but it matters what the standards are, of course. And, and so it, it falls far short, and in fact, it's even a rollback of even past agreements that were negotiated under Bush I for the environment. I saw one phrase that had to do with fisheries. We, we, you know, there's a problem all around the world with fisheries being overfished and far, you know, fish populations crashing and whatnot. And, and part of the problem is pirate fisheries, you know, uh, and, and part of the problem is just, you know, countries just fishing way beyond what's... And, and it, it said uh, member countries will endeavor Right. to protect nationally protected fisheries. So endeavor? Endeavor. Well, and that's, and that's right. the problem with, with yeah. the language in this chapter. It's member countries will, you know, be, be a nice guy. Don't, don't fish too much. Like there's no, without firm regulations, without saying this is enforceable, without saying, frankly, the U.S. Navy can come in and say stop doing that, right? right? If you wanted to actually have a chapter that stopped fishing, you would basically say that our Navy could basically tell your fishers to stop doing what they're doing right that's not what this says well and if you compare all you have to do is compare it with the intellectual property chapter yep. in the intellectual property chapter there you see they actually lay out that you have to have criminal penalties for small-scale copyright violations it written into your national and law you're obliged to do takedown notices yes, you you're obliged to, to turn right. over information you're obliged to do all these things you look at the environmental chapter it's like you know be a nice guy and they say shoulds, they say endeavor to instead of shall. All of the, And this legal language obviously matters a, a huge amount. And this is really interesting going into, look, at the end of this month, Barack Obama goes to Paris, right? 
to have the most significant climate negotiation of his presidency. And I think, look, that's part of the reason the Keystone was done now, so we could enter that, that and say, look, I just did this and show something good to the world. I, but I think this plays in the other direction, because now you have a significant treaty that works against the goals of the COP of the COP negotiation. Yeah. And the, may I just say Go one ahead, thing please. about, you know, a year ago, uh, the environmental movement was hailing the agreement with China when Obama was in Beijing and there, were, uh, there was an agreement to reduce carbon emissions. Right. This week we find out in the New York Times report that China was underreporting the amount of coal it was burning by 17%. Uh, which means that they're, you know, this, the, all this fanfare from last year is out the window. These other countries, the Vietnam, Malaysia, etc., I don't think they're in any better position than China to figure out what sort of environmental standards they have now or what they're doing environmentally now, let alone conform to something, you know? Right. It, it, it's just all this stuff is unenforceable, it's unmeasurable, uh, even if there were limits on fish. Well, there, there are limits on right. fish, right, in certain, but in certain not, fishing banks. But it's not unenforceable. Right That's where I just will slightly disagree. If we wanted to enforce it, it's enforceable. The copyright provisions of this, of this, well, let's of just, this let's trade just stay treaty with, are enforceable. Let's just stay with fish. People cheat, you know, countries cheat on fisheries all over the world sure. all the time. They're still using dynamite to fish with in the Philippines. <laughs> right. So, but, so it's, it's just to, to, to lead the American people to think we have this all nailed down and it's progressive and the world is going to be a lot better, it's just nonsense and it's so misleading. Yeah. I, to, I, to I take your point on, on the yeah. specificity. It's but not if, there. If yeah. you want, no, but my point is if you want to enforce something, you can enforce it. But when you don't want to enforce it, you can make you can make excuses and it's very clear from the writing of this treaty that there were certain chapters where people came in the pharmaceutical chapter very clear about extending right. extending patents and what's enforceable and what's not in terms of generics the IP chapter very clear about the penalties that you as a IP provider will face if you have content on your site that you're not dealing with IP meaning intellectual so, property yeah yeah and, and it and it makes it to to the point where you know as a guy who's who's on the air and I might read a paragraph out of a New York Times story or something to my listeners I mean you know at what point does that become a crime you know my, my understanding is even fair use is being challenged well the fair use is, you go to the fair use section of that chapter and it's it's the same it's, like it's not hey violent. you should you right. know do some fair use yeah. stuff right. Right. yeah yeah Kevin the uh, it seems in in the environment chapter and, and some of the other chapters, it almost seems like they're expecting the Arctic to be ice free. That, that <laughs> I, I'm serious. That some of the some of the trade things on here is, is there any is there any thought about that and what you know what that what that's going to mean for the East Coast of Canada and the U.S. and for the world for that matter? I, I think it, well, maybe my other panelists have a different opinion, but I, I don't think so. I think it's just too hard to tell. Mm. I mean, the thing that I'm worried about most is. This Chinese potential Chinese canal through Nicaragua, mm -hmm. uh, you know, first of all, destroying this immense freshwater lake that's, you know, the essence of Nicaragua uh, geologically, if you will, right. and, and then the, the Chinese container stuff, you know, right, and compete but, with the Panama uh, Canal. Well, I don't even care so much about the competition. It's just this sluice that yeah. you know is going to send all this stuff to the east coast of the United States and destroy the the ecology in Nicaragua. Yeah. Environmental um, organizations have been very concerned in addition to what we've already talked about with the environment chapter. The environment chapter, as I mentioned, I think it's more window dressing. When you look at the agreement as a whole, what you said at the beginning of this segment about increasing shipping um, and increasing, there's going to be huge more uh, um, uh, pressure to frack throughout the United States because the price of, of liquid natural gas in Japan is much higher. Under TPP, all of um, all of the exports of of, of LNG or natural gas would be automatically approved um, from the United States. That's part of what would be included. And so the, again, there would be this so huge much for push. The people in Longmont, yeah, Washington, huge who are pressure to that. to frack to get um, um, natural gas out of the ground. Um, Obviously, there's the concern around the investment chapter where polluters are able to actually challenge local ordinances to protect the environment or green energy policies that we put, into, put um, in place in the future could be challenged uh, if it affects the future profits of these of, of foreign corporations. 
and we would be expanding the liability by double. Basically, there were there are currently 9,000 corporations under our past treaties that have access to ISDS. There would be 9,200 more just under TPP um, of foreign corporations, Japanese corporations, and, and others that could who use can this. sue us. Can I just put sue a bullet us outside our courts? Melinda said that I think is just important for people to realize. If you want to export liquid natural gas, you have to get a permit essentially from the State Department. It's a process and you might not get it. Under TPP, it's literally just a rubber stamp. The State Department has to say yes right. to you if you're exporting to a TPP member country, which you know will ultimately include China and right now includes Japan. So it's is, literally be is, boom. Is that going to mean, uh, to, to any of you, is that going to mean that when, I mean, I was living in Portland, Oregon, when they were having battles over whether an LNG port was going to be mm -hmm. put in there in, in Longmont, Washington, on the Columbia River, just, just up the road from Portland, same deal. Uh, people, people out there uh, protesting, tying themselves to things, you know, yeah. is, is that because if the TPP passes, will they go in and say to the, to the gentle citizens of Portland, Oregon, sorry, you no longer have the right to determine what's going to be in the... And the, 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 large the Columbia or the, the, the large point Columbia. is this, uh, this is a regulatory regime that supersedes U.S. law right. and U.S. democracy. That, that's right. really the larger point here. We're, we're, we're just giving it all up to, uh, uh, for the benefit of certain number of multinational corporations and investment banks, etc. And, and we're just doing away with our laws and our regulations and our rule process in favor of this globalized uh, scheme. Wow. Um, clearly, the fingerprints of the fossil fuel industry are all over this thing. What's this going to do to petroleum prices, to energy prices, or does that even matter? I, it, it seems to me that, that, the, that, that the biggest consequence of this is the way it's changing our legal system. Do I yeah, know? I mean, the petroleum price thing, look, China's economy has slowed down, which is what's actually depressing petroleum price prices right. around the world. Along with other basic commodities. Right. Um, but. Look, I think, I think Kevin nails it. Look, if you want the ability for the elected officials in your country to make laws for your country, this, this treaty takes a piece of that away. And look, I'm actually a globalist actually by nature. Like, I'm actually fine with it. What I'm, but I'm a globalist in a democratic sense, right? This is not democracy. This is a group of people who get to sit on a commission that's established in perpetuity that will get to make decisions for you and I where we have no electoral recourse, where we can't, we don't, not even our elected officials have electoral recourse over it. And I think that's an important point, getting back to what you said earlier about whether the, these are our rules that we need to put our rules in place so that China or other uh, places don't, don't dictate well, the, the rules. Obama right, argument. Right, right, that was their, that was the ar argument, but Whose rules are these? Again, do we really want the rules to be set by a small group of corporations who have access to negotiate this behind closed doors outside of our democratic process? We would argue that's certainly not our values. Those aren't our values that we want to be exporting to the rest of the world either. Right. So and each of these individual issues that we've discussed so far tonight, you know, they would be the subject of extensive hearings and debates exactly. and maybe gridlock in Congress, you know, if it were done within the framework well, of American and democracy. specifically in the Senate, because this yeah. arguably should be a treaty. Yeah, right. but, but the point is, this is executive legislating. I mean, the Obama administration has completely bypassed Congress and, you know, presenting it as a fait accompli. Right. I mean, any individual chapter here would not take 90 this legislative is, is days, crazy. it would take forever. Yeah, and okay. Congress is, we're going around Congress too. More of tonight's, uh, with the fast track, more of tonight's conversation about this disastrous TPP right after the break. About your sudden passing, I've only just learned. You wore yourself thin, taking your last wrong turn. Your act got up to you as we all knew it would. I'd tell you I'm sorry, if only I could. So I write these last words in hopes to put to rest these things that I never got off my chest. I remember when we first met, my life turned on each breath. But then my feelings started to change. You talked about war like it was a game. Still some were fond of you, those that didn't like to question or argue. And I secretly promised to never be like you. It's said one does not leave a funeral the same as one enters. The mind gets consumed with death, but this one quite differs. 
I speak to you now because there were no other takers. To proclaim that mainstream media has met its maker. Here's what people have been saying about Redacted tonight. Give it to us. Redacted is full on awesome. So the only show I go out of my way to watch every week. Exclusive. It really packs a punch. Wow. Lee Camp is the John Oliver of RT America. You guys do have the same accent. Hey, we are apparently better than boobs. Nothing's better than boobs. You see, people you've never heard of love Redacted tonight. The president of the World Bank, though, hates it. Seriously, he sent us an email. The government thought their proposal for a merger was going to be a boom, but alas, it turned out to be a bust. We're in exactly the same crisis, only the situation is more dire now than it has ever been. The question then becomes, what happens when you have an economic downturn? China has pledged to contribute a total of $41 billion to the bank. Beijing has to keep it going. Some fundraisers are predicting the next election could cost $5 billion. Welcome back. It's not just our environmental protections that are likely to be undermined if the TPP is put into effect. It's also our food safety standards. According to Public Citizen, any U.S. food safety rule on pesticides, on labeling, on additives that is higher than international standards would be subject to challenge as an illegal trade barrier. And that wouldn't be without precedent under so-called free trade agreements. Under the WTO, the U.S. has been sued by both Canada and Mexico for our country of origin labeling laws. The law was challenged for violating free trade. And earlier this year, the WTO ruled against the United States' uh, appeal to keep our country of origin labelies, uh, labeling laws for beef and pork in place. We lost. And the TPP is a much larger trade agreement that includes 12 countries, many of which illegally import food and skirt U.S. food safety standards already, and in aggregate represent about 40% of global trade. So is this the end of any U.S. food safety standards? And how else would this trade deal permanently change the global food market? It's continuing with tonight's panel discussion on the details of this disastrous trade agreement, the TPP still with me, Melinda St. Louis, Ari Rabenhoft, and Kevin Kearns. Melinda. Human, I don't know how to say this without just saying it. Human poop, right, feces, and shrimp. What's the association here, and why should anybody be thinking those two things when they think of TPP? Well, it's pretty gross, but um, in Vietnam, one of the countries that are in TPP, the farm-raised shrimp um, is often done in vats of pools that include human feces. They're essentially um, giant septic tanks. Where the, where the shrimp uh, is grown. And um, currently, there is uh, the imports of Vietnamese shrimp and from other uh, uh, TPP nations as well. Only 1% of, of seafood imports are inspected at the border. And the TPP would vastly increase the, the volume without increasing the number of inspections. And it would make it more difficult. Um, it actually would empower corporations or the firms to challenge um, when at the border, when border inspectors actually hold um, hold uh, imports at the border for concerns, they, they actually have a rapid response mechanism where they can challenge it and, and, and get it out um, more quickly. So it vastly expands the, the concern around uh, so food safety it, of seafood so imports. So the challenge would, in other words, if an inspector is inspecting a, a, a boatload of shrimp and starting to get some uh-ohs, at that point the importer can say, I challenge that, right. and boom, the next day that shrimp is being consumed by American consumers, even though it's going to be another three days before the lab reports come back that it's filled with you it's, know, it's, human it's, poop 101. And I it's a huge danger. what every member of Congress who votes for this is going to say when their constituents yeah, get right. E. coli. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Uh, let's like look what look what's going on at Chipotle. Right. They've had a huge E. coli outbreak. Our agricultural inspection systems, as they are, are not good enough. Very clearly in this country, somebody's constituent is going to get sick because of this. Somebody's constituent is going to get gravely sick because of this. And any member of Congress who votes for that for this bill is voting for a treaty that does allow their constituents to get uh, essentially. Like, and it's not just Poison. shrimp, by the way. You go, go through 
the hundreds of types of food that we import that whose sanitary conditions, how do we put it, not necessarily what we would like to see. Yeah, like, like using septic runoff as fertilizer for fish farms. I mean, this is just... Well, we do um, that in the Midwest with pig farms right now, but that's a whole different story. That's pig farms. What? I mean, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty gross to pig farms, too. That's yeah. pretty gross. And, and this week, you know, John Kerry invited Russia and China to join the TPP. Now, the last time I checked, we were sanctioning Russia for the seizure of Crimea and for its activities in East Ukraine. And we have a big problem with their presence in Syria. But we're inviting them to join the TPP and China to join the TPP. And, and, we, and the we, argument with regard to China has been, we need to do this with these 12 countries before China does so we can control trade before they do. Yeah, well, the, the Politburo, unlike our US trade representative, Michael Froman and Barack Obama, the Chinese Politburo did not attend Harvard Law School. Right. So it's not a rules-based country. It's not a law-based country. It does what it wants. And it's not, certainly, it's not going to be bound uh, by whatever rules are in TPP. But connecting it to the food safety point, we, we know what safety is to the Chinese. So if the Chinese dock into this agreement and we see the, the, the polluted products of all sorts, now, I was just talking to uh, some people from mainland China this week, and they were telling me, we stock up on infant formula when we come to the United States. We get as much as we can, because it's, you know, the chances are that it's going to be poison in China are fairly high. Yeah. Uh, so sure, let's have the Chinese in and <laughs> see, see them just blow the food safety stuff out of the water. Yeah, we had a, we had a cat, I'm convinced, was killed by eating uh, Chinese cat treats because then he got kidney failure and it was like there, there was that chemical that was contaminating them. It was, it was nuts. You, you wanted to say something? Well, wrong? I was uh, not directly related to the food safety issue, but China actually doesn't need to be docked onto the TPP to gain benefits already. Under the rules of origin that were negotiated, the, actually the rules of origin for auto parts, for example, yeah. are way lower than they were under NAFTA. So now of a, a a car could have 55% of Chinese parts and still be considered a made in TPP uh, uh, made vehicle. In the USA. Uh, yeah, to be able to to benefit from TPP, uh, the 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 tariff negotiations. And so so while the administration continues to talk out of both sides of its mouth when it talks about China, because on one hand it's we need it to contain China. On the other hand, they're inviting China to join. China's already benefiting from not and not even having to abide by um, some of the rules that. That are are in there, but I think I, so. I think that that's a critical well, issue. It's as the well. Japanese supply. This, this is an excellent point. The, the Japanese supply chain extend for for their automakers extends to China, extends to Thailand, non TPP members. So apparently, one of the really big economic problems in the United States is Toyota is not selling enough cars and trucks in the U.S. And we're going to help them out by not holding them to a higher standard and allowing them to bring parts manufactured in China, Thailand, elsewhere, incorporate them into their cars and sell those cars even more cheaply in the United States. So, you know, we don't really need an auto industry. Obama claims he, he you know, he, he bailed it out, right, in, in the uh, uh, saving General Motors and what's right. now Fiat Chrysler, and now he's undermining them again. This is, so, this so, is such a contrast to uh, 1935, Franklin Roosevelt looked around and said, you know, what we have here is a, a failure of aggregate demand. In other words, the thing that drives an economy is people buying things and nobody has the money to buy anything. And when they do buy something, you know, the money might be going out of the country. And so we, they passed the Buy America Act. I mean, it's still on the books. And, and it said that any government purchases had to first be sourced to an American manufacturer. Bye -bye. And, well, it, they, they, in that Buy America Act, there was a provision that allowed the president to waive it during times of crisis. So uh, those waivers, this is like one of the big, I think, untold stories of the Reagan administration, is Reagan started passing these waivers out like they were, like they were lollipops. You know, companies come and say, oh, you know, we're a government contractor, but we don't want to buy American-made stuff. We've got to buy computers made in China, you know, for the NSA or whatever. And, and, and Ever since basically the Reagan administration, we've completely ignored the Buy America Act. And as a result, the, the percentage of American-made goods that are being bought with the U.S. tax dollars for, for government things is There are collapsed. TPP sections that address yeah. government procurement. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say we pass an infrastructure bill that says 
like we're going to build, let's say we do Bernie Sanders infrastructure bill, you couldn't guarantee that at, that asphalt is made in the U.S. You couldn't guarantee that the steel that we need is made in the U.S. You that couldn't is, even stop a foreign company from coming in and bidding on the job yes. and bringing their own asphalt from China. Yes, no. that's and under this treaty, you are absolutely right, and that's a huge problem. So, so basically, if we did a stimulus package after the TPP, it's stimulus for the world. That's right. That's right. Well, it, it has been in large to a large extent since the 1980s, just because of our insane trade policies. And, and this, Kevin, is, this is why the TARP and, didn't work. You know, the stimulus bill at the at the beginning of the Great Recession. Right. Because so much we, we don't make anything, or we don't make enough of stuff anymore, right. and it all hemorrhaged overseas. And now they've they've opened the door about as wide as it can go. Ari's right. Yeah. Yeah. It used to be the dollars would cycle through our economy 15, right. 18 times. Now it's down it's to two points. It's called the volumetric effect of money in an right. economy. It makes everybody richer. Right. Well, and, and, I, and I think people should just understand what this means is when we're talking about procurement, we're talking about our tax dollars, how we're going to spend our tax dollars. Are we going to spend our tax dollars to, to support local jobs, to support our neighbors and, and, have, and, and to stimulate our economy and to create more jobs? This has been an important job creation program in the United States. And TPP is basically just saying this isn't important anymore, that we will not uh, stimulate our own jobs with our tax dollars, right. uh, we need to uh, to do that elsewhere. Now I, I understand there's there's some kind of special deal in here for Monsanto and Dupont in the agriculture sections. Does anybody know anything about that? Stump me that on yet. this one. Yeah, I haven't gotten okay. to that yet. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll have to. Um, Kevin, I believe what, it though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's talk about the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, Kevin. The TTIP. TTIP. What is that? Where is it coming from? And why do we need to think about that in a context of a conversation about the TPP? Well, the TPP should it unfortunately pass when, you know, your viewers need to light up the switchboard from now, yeah. you know, until the 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 end of the Obama presidency in this congressional session, saying don't pass this thing. Right. But it will set the model for a similar type of trade agreement that the United States is negotiating with the European Union. Uh, fortunately, we know more about that agreement because the Europeans don't keep it as secret as our own administration does. Our own administration doesn't want us to know what's in it, right. lest we should become upset. Right. Uh, so we will have a massive percentage of the, the global economy uh, under these regulatory schemes that favor multinational corporations, banks, investment houses, etc. I mean, it's it's uh, you know, so uh, you, you mentioned you, you mentioned earlier about the John Birchers and the UN, etc. I mean, they. they this, when this John is worse than their worst yeah, nightmare. Their worst nightmare. Yeah. yeah well, exactly. the TTIP actually would go even further in the regulatory field, as, as far as we understand, than the TPP. There, there's a whole chapter that's being negotiated on regulatory cooperation that could that would give industry on both sides of the Atlantic an early uh, way of interfering with regulations or laws even before they're uh, initially proposed on either side of the Atlantic to be able to weaken, water down, delay any safeguards or protections that, that we want to put forward and it's, it's quite concerning. Last 15 seconds, Larry. Um, everyone should call their members of Congress starting now through the end of the year. Kevin's absolutely right. Like, yeah. that's you know, we can beat this. There's actually, Orrin Hatch has come out against it for the wrong reasons, but we need to... How do we get this in the media? That's yeah. the thing. I, anyway, Melinda, Ari, yep. Kevin, thank you all for joining thank us. Thank you. It's a great conversation. And that's the way it is tonight, Monday, November 9th, 2015. And don't forget, democracy begins with you. Get out there, get active, tag, you're it.